Well, thank you all for coming out. Really excited to be doing this here. Um, my name is Sart Rowe. I am with Northwest Justice Project, and I run something there called the National Technology Assistance Project. It's at the intersection of law and technology, and we try to help individuals uh, in legal services programs nationally implement new technology. Um, I've also worked with organizations including Disability Rights Washington to set up their first uh, big public um, social media based website. I'm on the board of Northwest Consumer Law Center and I also have some uh, gaming social media channels. So this is both a professional and personal area of passion to me. I'm given a little bit of an overview of kind of the landscape of social media and then we've got three wonderful experts here that are going to be covering different areas. We've got Brian Robick, um, who is with the ACLU of Washington. We've got Claudia Johnson, who's with Pro Bononet, and we have Elizabeth Fitzgerald, who's with one of the volunteer lawyer programs. Um, Fifty percent of adults use at least two forms of social media at this point in time. Most of them use Facebook and either Twitter or Instagram, although it's very demographic uh, specific. If you're targeting a particular audience, you want to figure out what they use, uh, not just choose one generally. For example, seniors is one of the areas where Facebook is growing. Uh, I believe it's the grandkid effect. Your grandkids get online and you want to see pictures of them. Um, teens prefer um, Instagram or Snapchat. Uh, there is something about the ability to use a service that your parents cannot uh, monitor all the time uh, that tends to attract that younger audience and where your grandparents are might not be where you want to share what you did last weekend. Um, LinkedIn uh, is up in use for individuals that are uh, college educated. Uh, LinkedIn is trying really hard to be a social network. Uh, a lot of individuals, though, use it only when they are ready to change jobs or uh, need to brush up their resume. Um, it's a good way to find volunteers, but it often isn't the best way to reach out to uh, clients. Um, the stats that we're going to be looking at here on the next few slides are from Pew Center for Internet Research. Um, they do updated stats every year. Um, smartphone dependency is actually going up. Broadband adoption is going down. Uh, we see that somewhere around 30% of households um, have smartphones as the only way to access the Internet, and that um, access may have limited data or may in some places uh, rely on outside Wi-Fi at coffee shops or at libraries. So making whatever choices you have mobile accessible is essential. For example, if you're doing a video, make sure to get it on a platform like YouTube that will automatically resize it and cut down the resolution when somebody is on a slower internet connection. Um, the uh, dependency on smartphones is also much higher among lower income individuals. Um, we're seeing 31% of individuals um, that have less, that make less than $30,000 a year. Um, and those um, stats are particularly high for both the Hispanic community and um, the black community who is dependent on smartphones. Um, Facebook has also uh, went to deprioritizing content that is from organizations. Uh, it really promotes individual sharing and to get people to see your stuff, even if you have a page that they have liked, you really have to pay to play. You have to put money into it or you have to find other people to share your stuff. One of the big differences between social media and other forms of media and a huge mistake that I see for people trying to dive into this is that they treat social media like a public radio where you talk at people when it should be like a good conversation show where you ask questions and you engage people back and forth. The broadcast versus interactive is extremely important. This is a post from Northwest Justice Project where we ask the question, do you have medical debt and cannot afford to pay? Our normal posts get maybe 100 um, individuals interacting in any way, including looking at it. This was over 2,500. That asking that personal question and asking them to engage does so much better than talking at your audience. One of the big things you need to do in social media is make sure that you are not seen as a robot. And there's a quick rule to help you out with this. It's the 80-20 rule. 
you need to avoid being a spam bot. So 80% of your social media should contain non-self-promoted content. You need to be sharing things from other people. You need to be asking questions of them. You need to be engaging. You need to have comments turned on, answer people's comments. The ability to be heard and listened to is what creates uh, fans, followers, potential clients for life. Getting past that robot spam test is extremely important. I'm turning it over to Brian Robick at this point in time, the Deputy Communications Director at ACLU of Washington. Hi, so I, I guess I have some news. Maybe I have to jump on LinkedIn myself, but I'm now the Communications Director at the ACLU of Washington as of a few days ago. Congratulations. Thanks, so I'm excited to share that with you, and I am also excited to share some planning tips with you. Um, I wanted to, so a little bit about me, I, I am the Communications Director, but throughout uh, my 12-year um, tenure at the ACLU of Washington, I have worked at the intersection of technology and online communications, and so that's sort of how I come to, uh, to running a communications department, um, and have grown up in this space along with um, a lot of the social media platforms that have been created uh, since since I started my job and have uh, changed um, over time. Uh, so I find this to be a very exciting uh, topic. And one of the things that I also think is really exciting is planning. And so I want to focus uh, my talk on um, planning at the 10,000, 20,000 foot level um, and talk about the work that you can put in in advance that will save you time throughout your social media execution process. Now, all of the things that I will present should influence what goes into an editorial calendar and um, possibly a scheduling, uh, a post scheduling tool, which I believe are things that um, Elizabeth will cover um, in the next segment. Um, and these planning tools should guide your day-to-day -day work, um, but they don't represent work that you invest on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. Um, you should do these things at the beginning and then periodically revisit them to make sure that they are helping you to achieve your goals. Um, a fundamental question is where you should be focusing your efforts, not just in social, but in, in your online efforts in general, um, which would include your website and your email list, among other things. Um, all of these different channels are linked, and each has pros and cons for achieving specific goals. The key is to choose the right set of tools for the job so that you are reaching your audience with actionable info in a useful format at the right time. Ultimately, you want your social efforts to promote your organization's goals. So start there. Um, do you want to provide services to people? Are you looking to raise funds? Do you want to reduce actual requests for services through providing self-service materials and education? Um, your online presence can help you achieve these goals, um, but you'll be more efficient if, uh, if you put some planning into how you use the various tools. Um, up. And a tool that I particularly like to use to help me make these decisions is a channel strategy grid. Um, which is one slide back. There we go. So there is the ACLU of Washington's channel strategy grid. Um, throughout the life cycle of, um, of a grid, it starts out really large, works its way down to something more concise like what you're looking at. I'd like to walk you through a little of the process of the thinking that goes um, into uh, the grid and then what we use it for. So. Um, for our social media presence, we had some very specific goals in mind. We wanted people to recognize the ACLU and think of us when thinking about civil rights and civil liberties issues. We wanted to distribute self-help materials to expand the number of people we can assist even though we have limited resources. We also wanted to connect those who need more help with our intake services so that they can get more personal assistance. And then finally, we wanted people to take part in our advocacy work and to look for us when they're looking for opportunities to take action. Um, further complicating matters for the ACLU, we have a, a really varied set of audiences, and we work in multiple spaces, and so we have to kind of account for all of the various issues that we work with, in addition to all the people in, who are interested in all of those 
uh, different specific issues. Um, so thinking about what um, social media and, and your online presence can do, we boiled it down to four things that, um, that you can achieve using online tools that map to our goals, which is brand affinity, which is essentially building a relationship with the ACLU online, recognizing us, coming to trust us, and um, having us come to mind when you're thinking about the issues that we deal with. The second is public education. We also wanted to provide uh, services directly online through distributing Know Your Rights materials, et cetera. And we wanted to provide an outlet for advocacy. These go in the uh, first column in the grid um, and so that you can um, eventually map various um, online channels to those jobs. We then listed all of the places we could potentially be. This was a really, really big list. Um, and I would encourage you to make the list really big, even though there is no way that you are actually going to work in all of those spaces. We had Tumblr on there. We had Pinterest on there. We had Snapchat. Um, uh, we had SoundCloud on there. There were a number of services that we just wanted to make sure we considered at the beginning, even though we know that um, given the number of people that we have to work on this, one, um, that uh, we wouldn't be able to be in all of those spaces effectively. Um, and we started to, to uh, for each of those, we gave each of those channels a role that we felt fit their primary strengths and what we wanted out of them. And um, we uh, then started to cut down the columns um, as we did that research. We also looked into the audiences that use each of those channels, which is something that SART covered. Um, and if we owned the platform, we did research into who was using it. So we um, sent out surveys to our email list to ask them, you know, what they, what they used our list for. And we asked our online users. We did some informal focus groups to see um, how people were using the site. And with those insights, we uh, then mapped uh, various jobs, the four jobs in the first column, to all of the um, channels in the grid. Um, we used this grid not only to decide where we should focus our efforts in terms of channels, but then also what types of content should go on each channel. Um, and this affects, um, uh, it, it's generally best not to broadcast out um, the same content to all channels because people use each channel in a different way and for a different purpose. So this helps us to decide what kind of content we'll do best in, in what um, platform. Um, we also, um, have an overall goal of trying to drive traffic. So we're trying to get people to engage with us on Facebook, but ultimately get to our website where they can get materials to download, or they can take action, or they can join our email list. Um, and so the grid also helps us to see um, the, the paths that we should be trying to lead the audience on. Um, so for example, um, rather than trying to promote videos on YouTube, which is something you can definitely do, you can buy ads, you can do uh, all sorts of strategies, we just use YouTube as a hosting platform and we use our other, um, our other channels to drive people to watch the videos there or those videos embedded on our website, et cetera. Um, so that's the channel strategy grid. And once you've built this toolbox of channels, the next decision is getting the right message at the right time to your audience. Um, it can be difficult to fill out a web form during a rush hour commute on a bus. It can also be difficult to find the privacy necessary to submit personal information about certain issues, like legal matters or health problems. Considering how your audience will receive your messages will make them easier to digest. I'd like to touch on two ways to do this. One is a highly detailed way um, that's very useful but can be very complicated, and the other is a quick and dirty way if you can't go uh, the whole nine yards. So the first way that I'd like to talk about is building personas. Um, these are profiles of fictional people that represent different groups of your users. So what you do is you think of the various different groups that you want to reach, and you flesh those um, ideas out into a set of people that you can imagine and kind of relate to in your mind uh, when you're creating and planning content. Um, you want to think through what they want, 
and not what you want them to want, which is often a very different consideration. I know at the ACLU we would really love for everybody to, to come to us uh, with our goals in mind, but they're actually coming to us usually for help. They're usually looking for materials that will help them, and then we get to introduce them to systemic problems that we can all work together to change. Um, and we also want to look at the constraints that are around them when they look for what they want. Um, and using this information um, allows you to tailor your resources and your services into their lives and schedules and not the reverse. So looking at a, um, a very short persona, this is extremely short, um, we gave this gentleman the name Jose and in age 16, he's Latino and identifies as male, he's a student in Skyway, um, and he has LGBT rights questions, uh, particularly in school, but he lives at home with his parents. And maybe he hasn't disclosed his um, orientation to them or to others. And so maybe needs some privacy and has some concerns about reaching out or sharing information, but is in desperate need of resources. Um, so when you're creating content to satisfy Jose's needs, um, you have to ask yourself if it would be useful to him. Am I sending this in a way that helps and does not hurt him? And am I sending this at a time and on a channel when he would see it and when he would have the privacy and space to interact with it. The truth is, however, creating personas can get really complicated. And you want to make sure that when you build personas that they're correct for your audience so that you don't end up going off in the wrong direction. The good news is you can experiment and check your results to see how things are going and adjust as necessary. You can change posting times. You can switch channels to see if you get results that are better for your overall goal, distributing resources, et cetera. And then you can adjust the grid in your personas as you, dis as you uh, make discoveries about the effectiveness of your planning. Um, I have a link in the course materials that you may find useful if you want to give personas a try. They, it goes into how to construct them into more detail. But if you don't have time to build personas, I also have a quick and dirty rule that you can keep in your head that um, is less audience specific, but will help you to choose the right message at the right time. Um, and it's the uh, difference between um, leaning back and leaning forward. Um, just ask yourself, am I sending this at a time when it would be convenient to use? Um, long web forms that ask for private information are probably not for rush hour when people are leaning back in their seat and have people looking at their phones, and they're on their phones, and it's hard to fill out long forms on your phones. Um, instead, maybe we should be sending out short value statements, infographics, things that build a connection between you and your audience, where basically they only just have to like or maybe write a comment back to you, something, something easy to do. Um, and instead, save the web forms and um, private, um, things that bring up privacy issues for people to, for times when your audience will have access to a computer and have some privacy. So now that we've talked a little bit about how to plan for the how, the who, and the when, the next is to talk about planning for the what. Um, and, this, uh, and in general, I'd like to talk about campaigns, so when you have a whole lot of content that you would like to string together into a conversation. In addition to having news-related and one-off materials, you should think about structuring your content to achieve your goals. Marketers and fundraisers talk about a funnel that your audience moves through. Um, at each stage, hopefully, they became, become more engaged with you, and it drives them towards whatever goal you're trying to achieve. We at the ACLU have a four-stage funnel. Uh, we start with awareness, move to activation, um, conversation, I'm sorry, conversion and stewardship. And I'll say that activation and cultivation are the same thing. Um, so starting with awareness, this is when you educate um, your audience about the existence of a problem. Um, when you're linking a problem to share values or linking an issue um, more generally to your brand. Um, activation and cultivation is when you're getting people on board with a concept. You're, you're interacting with them. This is definitely um, the home of a lot of very interactive content. And um, when you get them to do just a little bit more so that they start to become invested, but it's not actually the action, the final action that you're hoping that they take that maybe is a higher bar for them to jump over. 
Um, then you ask for a conversion. This is the this is the goal. This is the action. Whether it's activism, donation, asking them to reach out for help and share private information with you. And then you end with stewardship, which uh, shows that the action that they took matters, matters to you and matters to the world. And it also gives you an opportunity to continue engaging with them so that you can move them back to the front of the funnel on other issues or for other efforts. So to look at some of the things that we've done in the past for these different stages, starting with awareness, we'll post news articles um, and statistics and infographics. We also use this as an opportunity to elevate our community partners and post their content um, because it's good to show that you are a part of a community rather than just being yourself um, and off on an island. Um, and also uh, value statements, which sometimes make it easier for people to buy into the beginning of a conversation that they may have trouble talking about. So we're doing a lot of work right now on the way that the government deals with homelessness. And uh, we wanted to take our audience on a journey, um, starting with something that we know that they would agree with us on and getting them to move slowly towards agreeing with us on um, uh, deeper parts of our platform. And so we created a series of these graphics that are around having the police having to get a warrant before searching things and um, emphasizing that private property is private, period. And so uh, they show um, the types of property that would be owned by people of all sorts of income levels. And uh, these, we ran these for about two, three weeks, and they got a lot of interaction. They got shared, lots of great comments. It was exactly what we had hoped for. The little symbol there that says Get a Warrant ACLU, that's also a cell phone sticker that we give out. So um, we also had the benefit of tying to something that people had seen in the real world. And um, it, uh, it, it helped to get people ready. And then we started to introduce, using similar branding, uh, some content that, that gets into the activation and um, uh, cultivation stage. And um, here, uh, and I think this is the hardest part, um, we started to uh, release a series of quizzes um, that delve deeper into uh, the issue and that also served a myth-busting um, uh, function for us. Uh, so we have two quizzes. We're right now in the middle of quiz number one, actually, so we, we're, we're not fully through this campaign. This is one that's going on right now. And um, what we do is we use Twitter specifically, although we have sent out a few test messages on other channels, uh, where we ask the question and give the choices in the text with a link that leads to the entire quiz. And the quiz page um, has a little widget on it for each answer that shows and hides the answer, uh, whether you're on um, a phone or a desktop. So you can um, take the quiz um, in its entirety, even though you're only seeing one question. We find that it's really effective to ask the question and have people click to get the answer. And we've been using photo galleries to illustrate the multiple choice questions, which uh, makes, the, um, makes the post uh, more attractive to look at. These have also been doing well. Um, and we are getting a lot of um, interesting comments, um, some supportive, some not supportive, but the ones that we're really interested in are the ones that are in the middle that are kind of indicating that they are starting to see some, some things differently. And so that's really the goal that we were trying to, uh, to achieve there. In addition to these quizzes, which I think are a really powerful tool, uh, we also um, put out really quick and dirty infographics. These aren't super fancy. These can be drawn in uh, Canva and a number of other tools that are really easy to, to work with um, that uh, bring awareness to, uh, to some of the issues that we're working on and really highlight the things that we're concerned about. Uh, this particular one um, is meant to bring awareness about the dangers of pulling kids out of the classroom for discipline issues. Um, and when trying to offer services, in addition to um, providing paper downloads, as I was, uh, like PDFs um, or web pages to go to, we also created a set of videos which they require a little more investment from the audience. These are maybe 15 to 30 second videos. They're really short. They only cover one question. Um, and they're captioned so that you do, and that's very important to caption your videos because people won't always be in a place where they can turn on the audio to listen to you. 
Um, uh, so it gives people an opportunity to, uh, to take advantage of the video and to see that there's a face attached to uh, the questions that you're asking and the answers that you're giving. From this point, we move people to action. Um, we either ask them to sign a petition or to send letters to their legislators. We ask them to donate or to download a Know Your Rights Guide or to take a survey. Um, and then when um, results come out of a specific action, maybe it was a political action, et cetera, um, like a new policy or a law that was passed, we always try to close the loop and we announce uh, the results of the effort and, and try to target the same people that we were targeting to ask for help so that they uh, feel like they are included in the entire effort and not just used to further one particular tactic or one particular moment, but that they're partners with us. Um, and um, at the end of all of these campaigns and during, we try to measure our success. And so uh, the last thing that I want to talk about are some uh, ways that we measure success at the ACLU and um, hopefully give you some tips on how you can facilitate and make measurement easier. Um, so metrics are, of course, really important for planning because even though they come after, they create a feedback loop that allows you to readjust all the things that you planned. And we're constantly doing that. We never think of the planning process as linear. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a circle. It's a loop. Um, so uh, social media offers a lot of out-of-the-box measurements, but only some of them are useful some of the time. It's only worth tracking how many people have seen your posts if exposure is what defines success. It's only worth, worth tracking how many people like what you have to say if building public sentiment around an issue is your goal. Um, for us, we give each campaign a goal that is measurable. These form our key performance indicators, or KPIs. Um, when advertising a rights guide, we don't focus on the reach of our Facebook posts or how many people have seen the posts or like them. We focus on who has downloaded those, um, those guides. Um, if the number is very low, then we look back to see if maybe we had to put some money behind it on Facebook. Um, and then the reach number becomes useful. Um, but for the most part, our overall key performance indicator is how many people have downloaded the guide. Um, similarly, when, when we're uh, looking at petitions, et cetera, we're actually looking at the end product that moves the goal forward and not the uh, so-called vanity metric that um, social media providers will um, make available to you through insights or analytics. Sometimes it's useful, but um, make sure that you're actually focusing on what you're trying to achieve. So, um, and it's also one other thing to keep in mind, too, that some of the platforms are engineered and they look for ways to keep their users on the platform. Facebook is like this. Instagram is also like this in that if you don't pay, they don't send you away. <laughs> when you, uh, they don't send your users away. And um, they make it more difficult. So you might have a very successful looking post with lots of likes and comments and even shares, which can be helpful. Um, but if they're not actually able to get through to the thing that you want, um, it's not really a successful post. Um, one of the ways that we use uh, to determine whether um, our efforts uh, to, to move people from a platform to our conversion point is successful is to create a tracking link. Now, these aren't tracking links like Facebook likes, like buttons, et cetera, that gather all sorts of information about people. These tracking links basically just say, you, this anonymous person comes from tweet one, and they downloaded the guide. And so uh, the way that we construct that is by adding to the end of whatever URL your download is at or the page that you're hoping to get to people um, uh, a, little, a little appendage that is in this format. It's a question mark, a variable, an equal sign, and a value. Um, uh, so, but you, the question mark and the equal sign are the only things that really can't change. Those are the things that have to be there. Uh, for us, the variable that we always use is just MS, which is short for market source. And if you do um, action alerts, et cetera, from the ACLU, you'll see the MS. Um, and you'll know what, what we're looking for. It's, it's whether you came from a particular post or whether you came from an email, et cetera. And then for the value, we put something that indicates that you came from a specific post. 
This could be as simple as if you have five tweets, numbering them, so TW1 through TW5. Um, another thing that I think is really easy is to, um, rather than using serial numbers, uh, just put the date. Um, because if you're not posting multiple times on the same issue in one day, uh, it depends on how you have everything scheduled, then you know that it was the post that you sent out on that day that was super effective compared to all the others. And you can mimic that uh, content in the future. And then to gather the results, you use your website analytics program, which could be Google Analytics or the open source program Pyrex. Um, uh, and this will show you how many people have taken your download. And um, I have a copy here out of Google Analytics. Uh, hopefully you can read that. It's a little hard on my tiny screen here. Um, but you can see that uh, there is a download that doesn't have tracking links on it. That's how many people just got there um, organically in various different ways. And then there are tracking links that are after. Um, I, it's choice number three and choice number four, two different types of tracking links. Um, these have more variables in them than I introduced, but you really only need the, the one that I showed you in order to do this analysis. And then in the other columns, you'll have the numbers of times that those were downloaded. And that will give you a good indication of whether you're posting at the right time, in the right places, and using the right content by comparing all of your attempts to get people to download this stuff with each other. Um, and uh, just as a little hint, if you are using Google Analytics, one amazing thing that you can do is you can bring this screen up, tailor it so that it looks the way that you want it to look, and then you can tell the system to email you this report periodically. So you do not have to keep going back in here. You can tell, you can tell it, I want this report every Monday at 9 for the past week. And then you've got an instant report delivered to you um, that will help you to adjust your plans without having to go through the effort of doing all of this. And then the last thing that I wanted to share with you um, are some resources. Um, metrics are really great, and comparing against yourself is really great, but it's also really important to be able to compare against others in your uh, sector and in the nonprofit um, sphere more generally. M and R, um, a consulting firm, puts out a wonderful benchmark study every year that you can download at the link on the slide. Um, it's free. And uh, it will give you lots and lots of benchmarks on all sorts of things, um, like audience size, um, number of people donating, average size of donation, people who take action on um, calls for activism, um, how many of your emails are being opened, how many people unsubscribe every time you send an email. Um, it's an amazing resource, and it's broken out um, by uh, sectors of the nonprofit sphere and also by the size of the organization. So if you're very, very small, you can get benchmarks that are still relatable to the work that you do. And then I'd like to close out, because I've been talking a lot, and I realize I have some very boring, generic-looking slides. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll let uh, Elizabeth take over. Uh, but I wanted to mention two quick things. Um, not necessarily social media, but I think they're wonderful resources for people who work um, online and do communications. One of them is that you can get free hardware, software, and services at TechSoup if you're a 501c3, so you should Google that, and if you need software, et cetera, you can often get licenses and things there. And then the last thing that I want to draw your attention to is a wonderful online, um, a wonderful online and real-world community called the Nonprofit Technology Network. You can find them at nten.org. Um, and here you'll find wonderful collection of peers who are able to give you advice on social media, online communications, fundraising, and so much more. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brian. So uh, my name is Elizabeth Fitzgerald. I'm the executive director down here in Vancouver at the Clark County Volunteer Lawyers Program. Um, I have been in this role for about a year and a half, and uh, I have not, I'm not an attorney, I have no legal experience, um, and I have a very small staff. So we just added our fourth staff person last month. None of us um, are attorneys, and everybody's doing about eight jobs. So um, what, uh, something I find myself saying frequently is I've never been the social media manager where I've worked, but I've always um, been the one who manages the social media. Uh, and uh, I, 
I see that definitely in the work that we're doing here, where in addition to being the executive director and keeping the lights on and getting funding and doing our bookkeeping, I'm also trying to um, build our uh, build the awareness of what we do. Um, when I came in, we didn't have uh, we had a a pretty outdated website, and that was it. Um, and even though our organization has been around for about 30 years, uh, very few people in our community who didn't work directly with us had heard of us or the work we did. So we're definitely in that um, that gaining exposure phase that Brian talked about, uh, where that is one of our biggest goals with, with our social media and our web presence. So um, I can talk forever um, about what uh, – what we do and all the cool tools that we have. But I kind of wanted to take you through the journey that I've had to go through in figuring out how to prioritize uh, what's actually most important to get to our end goal. Um, so uh, these are some questions. This is a very crazy, overwhelming slide. But these are some questions that uh, I definitely ask myself um, when I think about prioritizing the social media channel. Who are you talking to, but who's actually listening? Uh, these are things that um, both Sart and Brian spoke to. Um, what's the best channel for you to be using at this time? Uh, what are also your goals, right? Uh, don't be using Instagram if you have, like, no pictures to post ever, uh, which is something that you, we deal with. We see uh, everything's protected under confidentiality. We don't really have a lot of self-produced um, photos. And so what we're trying to do is just continue to build our community. So... With all that, I know it's pretty overwhelming. Um, so what I have always found to be the number one priority when looking at your web presence uh, is actually starting with your website. Um, so you should think of your website as a home base. Uh, this is where you store the timeless information about your work, uh, and it's what still carries the highest credibility for accurate information. So I see a lot of times people trying to use a Facebook page as essentially their website, especially really small businesses or private practices or tiny nonprofits. They're like, hey, people are out there. We can talk about this. Um, but actually, there's been tons of studies done on this. Uh, there's 30%, I think, of consumers won't trust a business without a website, even if they have a current up-to-date Facebook. Um, and almost half of people say they decide on a company's credibility based on the website design, layout, typ typography. So, you know, what, it, what the text looks like. If you're using, like, green font on a purple background, it might seem a little less credible than just a clean, simple website. Um, so that can be kind of an undertaking to build a website, though I built our entire website from scratch. Um, there's a lot of good templates for that uh, to be able to do that, whether you're using Squarespace, um, WordPress, whatever, and if you can't put everything on there, um, there's some very specific things that you, even if you have just one single landing page, you didn't link to anywhere else that you should be having in your website. Um, so what I call out there are a heading, <laughs> so um, something that says uh, this is um, this is what we're all about. Um, something that says uh, that's going to be clear, concise, um, a subheading, which is a tagline of what you do, um, but make sure you leave out the jargon. So, hey, we're the volunteer lawyers. Uh, we help you if you don't have a lawyer. <laughs> that would be something really simple. Um, and, uh, and a call to action. So for ours, that's a giant orange donate button in the middle of our page but maybe you are someone who schedules appointments, you have a schedule button, um, learn more. Uh, but uh, whatever you're having there, uh, what I think is the number one thing is, is something pretty. Because everybody has seen those studies that say, you know, people spend, I don't know, 10 seconds on a page, 20 seconds before navigating away at most. So that's why our web page, and this is just a screenshot of our web page, is just a huge picture with <laughs> like seven words and a button. Uh, and that's our home page. You can scroll on, you see more, you can link to other things. Um, but we want this to be a landing base for everything that we do. So as we add channels, as we add some Facebook presence and Twitter presence, um, anything that 
that is connecting what the content that we put on that social media channel, anything that connects it back to the services that we do at our core, there's always a link driving people back to our website. Um, and then finally, um, we have search engine optimization or SEO. Uh, this is super important and super easy. So it's a free tool I didn't stick in here in my little chat, but Yoast, Y-O-A-S-T, uh, is just a plugin that you can stick in WordPress or um, most other uh, web builders. And it lets you just call out. So when somebody's searching for certain, certain words to make it so that your website um, rises to the top if you're trying to get that, that presence. Um, and finally, making it uh, optimized for mobile, as Brian said. Um, and start that the dependence of mobile phone use is going up. Uh, one in five households don't have their own internet in the U.S., uh, and they rely uh, only on mobile devices. So you want to make sure that whatever you have on any of your platforms uh, is looking just as nice mobile as not. And if you're building any of these things, especially in a website, there's usually a really easy way to click a couple buttons and make it optimized for mobile. Once you've got your nice, pretty website, um, then uh, you have to start looking at expanding if you want to try to reach more people through social media. Um, so if, uh, if you're the only person managing your social media like I am and web presence, then, uh, and it's not your full-time job, it's likely not in your best interest to put the same effort into every one of those social media channels. Um, so you look at what's your audience using. Um, you can either look at some data or find out uh, by just sending out a quick survey monkey. If you have an email list, what do you use? How do you want to talk to us or engage with us? Um, or just set up a landing page on multiple platforms and monitor engagement either through that interface or through Google Analytics, which is what we use. Um, we found that our community use Facebook primarily. Um, so even though we have each of these three things, Facebook, Twitter, and a LinkedIn, uh, Facebook is where we put most of our eggs. So um, we actually we maintain a landing page on LinkedIn, and um, I think it was a hair of Rosetta Brian who said that uh, that's a great place to get volunteers. For us, most of our volunteers are attorneys. They use it sort of like either a Rolodex or a place to say, yeah, I also volunteer at the Volunteer Lawyers Program. So it just allows them to connect, or our employees to connect their association with the organization. We don't really put a lot of content there. Um, and we uh, use Twitter to engage other entities. So that's where we're connected with other nonprofits, um, with uh, agencies that are pursuing similar missions so that we can retweet that and show our support. We can find something. We, we use it to follow a lot of other agencies. And then we say, hey, that's an issue that we also address, and this is how we address it. And so we'll retweet it, and we do that thing where we're, we're sharing in, in the issue rather than just uh, demanding something of our audience. And so we say, hey, what about this? If you're having this concern, remember you can hit us up, and we've got this information for you. Um, but our Facebook is definitely the most active of those channels. Um, this is just a really tiny screenshot of our Google Analytics page, but it's free and it's quick. And, and by quick, I mean like you can get pretty much anything you need there within 30 seconds to a minute uh, for using it once you've linked it to the page that you need. Um, but I know I've just <laughs> done all of that, and this is not, these are not things that I monitor or even pay attention to every day. Um, so, since I'm trying to focus on identifying some, some tools and tricks for automating what you're doing, if you're the person who has to manage all this and you just don't have time for it, here are the things that you want to consider. Um, so just as there's tables that you can build, there's schedules that you can build, or um, the audience you want to reach based on the type of information that you're releasing, this is a good thing to think about is scheduling posts. So we work in the legal field. I see a lot of really small single practitioner law firms running their own blogs. Um, I don't ever read their blogs. And <laughs> so many of them are good friends of mine. And I know they, they're pushing content because they've heard that this is how you get engagement. Um, but if you've got a website that's a blog and you aren't driving traffic to that blog, 
and you're not reminding people to go back and read that blog, then you're just putting empty time into writing content that nobody's going to read. And so you want to be thinking about um, if you're putting the work in to publish a blog post, then you're getting the most uh, use out of it possible. So depending on the channel, uh, sometimes like on Twitter, you can be just reminding people over and over again, here's a whole bunch of different angles to look at it. Remember, we wrote a blog post on this. Go back and read it. Facebook, it's all about playing with that algorithm that the guys spoke about. Um, you got to do a lot of tricky stuff to try to get your posts to ride to the top. But uh, Facebook, you can continue to call back to it. Um, and then LinkedIn is uh, a... I don't see stuff really recurring to post there. If somebody sticks something out, it's current. If you happen to be on the site, you see it. Um, but we're, of course, focusing more on Twitter and Facebook. So you can either schedule those things internally, um, which is great, uh, or you can use uh, one of my favorite tools, which is Buffer. And so this is free. I actually have a, I use Google Chrome as my web browser, and I've got a browser extension. Um, so it's just at the top of my browser. If I'm on a site, if I'm reading about an article, we don't publish blog content, but it could work very similarly. Um, I'm you know, reading something, I'm like, oh my gosh, our network will really love to hear about this. I literally push a button and it brings this uh, screenshot that, that you see in front of you, which allows me to write something and customize it for each network. Uh, so if you you know, want to push the same thing, like, hey, remember, this thing's coming up, or did you hear about this event? It might work across platforms. But um, as Brian said, it's not always the best to broadcast out to all channels, um, so customizing is, is usually your best option. But you'll just see just three separate text boxes. You can add the same images to all of them. Um, before this webinar, I pushed something out on all three of our channels. And it took me 25 seconds, I timed myself, <laughs> to say, hey, Liz is doing this webinar, come check it out. And I added four images to each. And um, already started getting engagement with those posts. So um, I love Buffer, and I will talk at length about it to anybody who wishes to listen. Um, but here are three other tools that I use to help automate. And it seems like you're investing a lot of time, but each of these things is very simple. And at the end of this, I'll show you a real quick breakdown of the amount of time I actually spend in doing any of this. So uh, Brian mentioned doing an editorial calendar, which I think is crucial. Uh, you shouldn't just be blindly throwing content across the web without strategically thinking about when and where and how you're engaging your audience. And so what I use as our editorial calendar is Trello, which is, I've heard it described as a whiteboard with superpowers, and that's one of my favorite descriptions of it. Um, you, you could just be a sticky note person, and maybe that works for you. Um, you could use an Excel spreadsheet. But this is like a drag and drop um, masterpiece. So this is just a quick screenshot. This isn't even my Trello. This is Peg Fitzpatrick, who's a social media blogger. But this is very much how it looks on, on most ways. You can monitor how you're doing. Any of those little boxes you can drag across to the next step. Um, so for our social media um, Trello, we have uh, the first column is like things I want to write about. The second column is in composing mode. And the third is uh, queued up. And then the fourth one is published. And so maybe I have two hours miraculously on a day where I just want to write a bunch of content, make some pretty stuff that I know I'm going to be pushing out over the course of the next week or month. And so I'm sticking all that in there. Um, once I've stuck it in queue, which you can do in Buffer uh, or in any of those platforms, you can schedule a post so that you don't have to be up at 2 a.m. to post something that you want to go out at 2 a.m. Um, once that's all queued up, I move it over to my queue. Um, and then once it's gone out and I'm regularly, I just check my Trello to make sure that uh, everything's on track, then I'll move it over to the, to the published column. So Canva is, if anybody asks me what my very favorite free tool is, uh, Canva is absolutely it. Um, I do, when I took over this position last year, we paid a printing company to do, to make our brochures, to design them, to print for us. 
um, and I brought that all in-house. So uh, that's something that myself, with a little help from my program director, uh, we make all our own content on Canva. And Canva is a beautiful, uh, super simple graphic design. You can get templates, so you're really just changing out the images. You can start from scratch. Um, but it's really great for making those infographics that Brian was talking about, as well as uh, all of our content, all our brochures, any graphics you ever see on our Facebook, our website. For the most part, I've probably made it in Canva. Um, so this is just a real quick screenshot of uh, content on our, on our Canva. Um, we just had an event. Um, we've got our trifold brochure. And uh, you know, there's also options to, um, to develop your brand. So if you, we're still in kind of reviewing our branding mode right now at our organization. But if you have specific colors, a font, um, things that you use, there's an option in Canva to say, here's all that. Um, so I want any content that I produce to reflect that, and it'll shortcut for you. Um, but speaking of, oh, and then, yeah, here's another little thing I just busted out. Um, so Canva's great. I'll also talk to anybody who wants to talk to me about Canva. So when I mention, you know, colors, maybe your branding, uh, I think that's one of the biggest holdups when people try to um, make pretty content by themselves is they're saying, uh, I, don't, I can't get the colors to look right. I've got this image, but the font looks funny. Um, Adobe Color uh, is free. Uh, it's just a web app. You can drag an image into it, and it'll automatically push out um, a, a color spectrum of things that go with that image. So here's a screenshot of something. Um, Yes, it's me and the friends and my friend Jamie. We're attending an event. And um, if I wanted to push this out, uh, maybe say, hey, you should come to this charity event that we hold. We're always really interested looking when we're attending. Um, and you wanted to make sure that whatever colors you have, you can choose. Uh, you can either customize. So I intentionally dragged the dot over her hair so that I got the pink color. I got the green in the background. Um, but if you want only muted tones or if you want bright tones, there's just that drop down on the side to change the color mood. And you can copy and paste the hex code from these into whatever uh, you're using. If I'm, so I go back to Canva and I say, I want my background color to match this exactly. And I do that. Um, or you can just save the color scheme because you're like, I want everything I ever do in the future to have this color scheme. You can do that as well. So here's the rule I try to adhere to. Um, you know, I, I'm the director, so I probably work 60 hours a week. And um, most of that time is absolutely not even thinking about uh, our website, our, our presence online. Um, but my goal is to spend 30 minutes a day, two days a week. So I usually just stick on my calendar, like, social media checkup. And I know that that day I'm going to be checking in on my social media. So I will come in. And I just, one day when I was doing this, I just wrote down what I did. <laughs> you could see uh, realistically what it looks like. Made a cup of coffee, checked my email. Um, I checked my task list. I actually use Google Tasks. I didn't talk about that either, but that's another um, Chrome extension. Um, and then I spend five minutes planning for social media marketing and communications tasks. So that's where I get into Trello and I say, okay, here's the things that I want to do um, this week or over the next two weeks. And then I give myself 10 minutes to do what I can in that amount of time. So it's probably drafting things or going and, and trying to scope out if I'm going to build something in Canva, what that's going to look like. Um, and then I say, okay, my 15 minutes are done, and I go about the rest of my day. But then before I leave, I uh, go back in, I spend 15 minutes, I check on my Google Analytics, I post interactions in Facebook, in Twitter, um, or I complete building the actual post. Um, and with that, we have a, a pretty thoroughly engaged um, Facebook community. Um, something that I did remember uh, after hearing Brian say it was uh, talking about answering comments and questions on Facebook. 
So uh, because we have such a small staff and um, most people who are trying to reach us are prospective clients, uh, we feel like we, one, can't answer all the phone calls that come in. And so we spend all our time, um, I have staff who are just constantly trying to return those calls and make sure that people get the information they need. And so we try to open up as many channels as possible. Um, so we, we accept comments on Facebook. Um, people will leave weird Google reviews because we have a Google presence. Um, but I do feel very strongly that uh, you, you, one, need to acknowledge that not everything that's coming to you is going to be positive, um, but also that uh, if you're opening up comments, you need to be responsible to, to addressing those and answering them. Um, so sometimes it's like, hey, it sounds like you're having a really hard time. Here's a phone number. Give us a call. Leave a message. Or, hey, we've got this clear hotline. If you need help immediately, you should call them. Um, and sometimes it's uh, someone wasn't happy because uh, they, their divorce didn't go how they thought it would be, and so they leave a Google review because our page is open to that. And so it's about us acknowledging that not everybody is happy, and in opening yourself up to the social media community, you need to uh, deal with the positive feedback as well as the critical. So addressing each of those timely um, and, and with courtesy uh, is what helps ultimately um, build your community with that. Finally, uh, Brian had mentioned uh, the N10 Nonprofit Tech Network uh, to you guys. And I actually sit on the planning committee down here in Vancouver, and I think that is an amazing thing. So if you have any, you have an N10 group locally where you are, uh, usually it's a space for people to come and meet once a week, once a quarter, once a month, whatever the, the setup is and uh, just hear about free tools, uh, maybe how do I clean up my data in Excel, uh, things like that to keep you continually learning. And putting something like that on your schedule to attend rather than having to go and learn by yourself all the time um, is going to keep you up to date, uh, but also clear up your schedule. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to my good friend, Claudia Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So I'm excited to be here. Lots of really good um, suggestions, and I'm, I'm actually learning a lot. I'm Claudia Johnson. I'm with Pro Bono Net, um, and I am based in eastern Washington. Pro Bono Net is a nonprofit technology company where we look at what technology we can bring to bear to help uh, close the justice gap and support legal aid and pro bono projects. Um, I am not an early adapter. I'm very much an Xer, and I came to social media much later. I would say five to five to probably two years um, that I've been experimenting and adapting. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about how do we talk to the real world, world about what we do in civil legal aid and some of what we've been sharing, like Facebook. Facebook is where people are. Twitter, that's how you push a specific uh, blog post and things like that. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the slow world because Eastern Washington is the tech, and by, by the slow world I mean that not everybody is living in a hyper-connected, hyper-internet-based world. There are parts of the country that because of geography and other barriers, there are large pockets of community that may have some access to the fast world, but a lot of what's happening is not like that. And so you need to have a mix. And if you want to find between you know fast world activities like the social media that we're talking about, but also you as a person, as a legal aid lawyer, as a supervisor, as an executive director, if you're in a community that's more rural or has deep geography or weather barriers, you may be able to use some, some technologies to talk to people that are not in your world. So that's what I'm going to be sharing. And um, what I do is I manage Low Help Interactive, which is an online platform that has uh, created to date probably a little bit over 4 million free documents. And I spend a lot of time talking um, with 40 to 43 states 
about how to create online forms, how to get self-helpers to use the forms, e-filing, all of that. My life is in that world. And I speak to lawyers and pro bono coordinators and court administrators and stuff like that. And I don't get to talk much about the great work that civil legal aid is doing or that the forms are doing or that technology is doing with real average people that have nothing to do with the practice of law or courts or anything like that. So I started to think, well, what what can I do about that? Because I'm somebody that's a very much like to test and challenge things and challenge myself. And so with, when um, Justice and uh, Voices for Civil Justice, which is a support group that's based in Washington, D.C., was originally created, and I really encourage everybody to check check out their blogs and subscribe to the information they're putting out. They came out probably about three years ago. They were funded to be a support group to legal aid and do research, public opinion research. They brought some of the best people, and they started researching like what messages resonate with people about civil legal aid and stuff like that. When they came on board, I was like, wow, this is amazing. They're really giving us guidance on how we can talk with the real world. Um, and so I started thinking, well, how can I take that and actually bring it to this concern I have that I want to get the message of what civil legal aid um, does and, and does and provides as guidance for us to talk about the work we do with real people, not with the, not with the industry. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to check out what what opportunities are there, and I decided that I was going to compete for a TED grant, a, a TEDx um, competition. And I didn't know what I was getting on uh, into that, but I thought, okay, if this is a challenge, <laughs> this, is, this is going to be a challenge. And I'm going to take, because at the TEDx, I'm going to have my community, which is not necessarily a friendly audience, and I get to talk to them about civil legal aid, technology, and all the things that that we're doing, that I love doing, that I know my partners love doing. And so I did the TEDx, and that was amazing. And I actually did a little blog for um, Voices. And so uh, I'm not going to get into, into, you know, I shared the lessons and the challenges and how scary it was and all that. Um, but what I wanted to share with you, I seem to be missing some screens here. Um, is that the feedback was amazing. It, um, after the, the voices presentation, the, using the voices to de develop my tech talk, um, I've gotten a lot of feedback. And what's happening now is that I'm being asked to go to other places where they have never thought, you know, there's a little video going around right now that was created by Illinois Legal Aid Online about how there's no representation in civil legal aid. Um, that's how I started my tech talk. That message is a message that most regular people have never ever thought about. Most people assume that they're always going to have a lawyer. And um, when you talk to real people about how there is no civil representation in school issues, in housing, etc., people are really totally shocked. And um, what has been happening is that in Eastern Washington, uh, people are now more aware of that. They're more aware of the online tools like uh, Washington No Help because that's one way to get people information and referral. And they're also more aware that there's actually legal aid offices there. So what's been happening after the workshop for me is that I'm being now requested to go talk to other groups like educators, librarians, um, groups that are not necessarily in uh, clinics, like um, nonprofit clinics, that are not in the legal aid world, and they're requesting to come and hear about what civil legal aid is or is not, and then what can they, how they can they connect with civil legal aid lawyers. So what I've been doing is that I've been teaming with the managing attorney of the Pasco office, Carla, from um, Northwest Justice Project. And we go together and we talk together about, okay, what is civil legal aid and how people don't have representation. And then she talks specifically about the type of cases that the office is doing and how to connect with them. So um, my, my main 
goal in doing this was to really start changing my lens, you know, and instead of always talking to the same community, which is inside the legal profession, is let's just really make a concerted effort to talk to people outside the legal um, world, and let's go talk to the real world. And um, in the process of doing this, what I have found out is that when you talk to the real world, meaning outside of the legal community, people start feeling empowered. People start helping themselves. People start seeing what you're putting out there, groups, what you're putting, your groups are putting out in Facebooks and all of that. But sometimes you do have to have that human um, percept, percept, you know, connection. The other thing is that, you know, all of us in the legal aid community come from come from diverse groups, but we're not as diverse as that real world. And so if you look at the data that LSC publishes, um, you will see that, you know, the majority of people being served by legal nonprofits, at least the LSC funded uh, ones, are 65% of them are not white, and a great majority of them are female. But that's not who is in our programs. And so we have to make an extra effort and change our lens to go and connect with these communities, talk to them, develop relationships so that we can address their issues. So what I'm doing now is that, you know, I've come to realize, wow, you know, so there are other ways to connect with the community. And there's a lot of civil organizations that are constantly looking for speakers and that have a lot of um, sometimes economic power or connections. And those include groups like Lions Clubs. In my area, we have Badgers, which is a, like intellectual lunch that happens once a, a month where people go talk about a specific issue. Um, the most recent one that they did was about mental health for the youth. Is that a myth or is that actually a real issue? And there's a lot of other groups out there that are looking to learn and connect with uh, about topics that they may not know anything about. So I think that if you have the opportunity to start connecting with these networks that may be networks of leaders themselves or influencers, you will start finding that, that you can have conversations with them, even if they're in a completely different spectrum using some of the materials that Voices is doing. And what that does is that that creates an awareness that there's civil legal aid that's doing amazing work, that there's actually experts living in the community that are actually tackling these issues, and you can have a chance to impact the community that you work with positively. So um, I'm going to leave you with some resources. Um, and um, I'm sharing my TEDx video. If you want to watch it, it's on YouTube. Um, it was a lot of fun. I, if you are living in an area where they do TEDx competitions, I encourage you to consider participating and topic, talking, talking about your ca a case or a challenge or something that you're really passionate about. It will make you a better speaker, and it will get your topic out there. Um, as much work as it is, it's, it's incredible. I think that you can also... Um, Really encourage you to look at the Voices for Civil Justice, look at the materials that they have. They will help you message across social media, like we talked earlier, but it will also help you if you decide that you're going to take the challenge of going and talking to people that are not in our world, but that are in the real world. And so if you want to change your filter and focus on talking with regular Americans that don't know, maybe they don't even care about legal aid, and you want to start building that, um, really encourage you to change your filter and just jump in and challenge and search for that. And the, the, the voices materials are great. And I think that at the end, you will find that your impact will be better and higher. And you may uh, be connecting with other groups that may never have thought about becoming legal aid allies. And I think that at the end, our work is so important and there's so few of us that it's really important that we can leverage our presence in the slow world and also in the fast world. So I'm going to leave it at that and um, see if people have questions or comments. So th thank you. Um, I 
want to open it up in for questions on pretty much anything at this point, please type them into the question box. Um, we can read those out uh, for individuals. Um, first question that I've got here is um, on using a scheduling tool like uh, Buffer. I realize that there's a there's a free version, there's some paid versions. Uh, which which version do you use, Elizabeth, and why did you make that choice? Um, well, I use the free version because my budget for social media is zero dollars. So that is the answer to that question. Um, for what I need, I don't need um, any of the other premium stuff um, for Buffer. Um, but, I mean, if you become just like a real aficionado, um, I think you can, or if you have a whole bunch more channels, I think that's when it's good to upgrade. Um, if you're scheduling like a huge campaign, I think you can do like 100 posts or something. Um, so I tend to use it more short term. Uh, here's something I'm going to want to push out. So I'm going to stick it in queue, and I've only got a couple channels. But um, if you are just maybe much larger than us, then you're probably going to want to go, uh, you're going to want to upgrade. But I am happy with the nice little free version. Um, and, and Brian, at ACLU, what, what tools do you use? What are the costs around that? And why have you made those choices? So we've used a number of tools over time. Um, the, what we're currently using right now is we're actually scheduling natively in Facebook and in Twitter. Uh, for Twitter, we use TweetDeck, which is uh, just a, a free um, format for looking and, and posting um, on Twitter uh, that Twitter provides. It's at tweetdeck.twitter.com. And on Facebook, we use the scheduling tool. There's a drop down next to where it says post or publish. Um, and in that drop down, you can use choose schedule. In the past, we've used two tools that I really like, and I can tell you like what we liked about them and why we decided not to stick with them. One of them was Hootsuite, um, which is a competitor of Buffer, um, but it's been in the space for a very long time. Actually, I actually think I like Buffer better than Hootsuite, but um, uh, Hootsuite in, also includes some analytics that can be useful, um, but since we've then moved from looking at social media native analytics to ones that are off of social media, like did you download this, did you donate this, et cetera, that became a little less useful for us and we were paying for Hootsuite, so we dropped it. And then the last tool, and I love this one, you do have to pay for it, but they do have a nonprofit rate that is um, very affordable. It's a tool called Meet Edgar. And what it does is it fills in all of the gaps between the posts that you intentionally want to put out because they're on the news cycle or they deal with uh, specific points in time, like events, et cetera. And it allows you to basically like promote know your rights guides, resources, et cetera, over and over again in this giant library. So you load up all of your tweets and Facebook posts in here with all of the art and over time, working on this even 15 minutes a day, within like two months, you've got hundreds of posts in here, and it randomly selects out one of them, posts it at, at, at a window that you tell it to. You, you set up these windows. So for us, it was all of the times when we knew we had some audience, but we also knew that we weren't going to be around to directly react to things. So it was stuff that we knew we could reply to comments in a delayed fashion, et cetera. Um, and it would automatically publish those and then reshuffle them back into the deck. Mm -hmm. So it was really useful. We got rid of it, maybe only temporarily, because I really like the concept, because after all of the uh, Russian interference scandal um, stuff broke, Twitter in particular changed its terms of services. And they do not allow you to directly tweet the same tweet twice. And the way those terms of service are written, um, it's, uh, it's not time bound. It's, it's that you're not allowed to tweet the same thing exactly twice ever, or you put your account in danger of being shut down. So you can definitely use a tool like Meet Edgar, and Meet Edgar is adjusting to this by making it easy to create variations on the tweet. and. Um, uh, so that you're talking about the same guide and you're talking, you're you maybe even using the same picture, but you're, um, but you're changing the language just slightly to obey the rules. Um, it certainly adds a little bit of challenge and time to, um, 
to repeating your content. Mm -hmm. We used to just repeat the same thing, but you know, a week later and then a month later. Right. And we actually used the same grid that Elizabeth put up um, mm -hmm. in her slides, which I, I really love. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of reeling due to that, but we may go back yeah, to Yeah, that's very interesting because eviction doesn't go away and you have a whole different audience that's facing that unfair eviction next month. But having to tweak the content to make sure it doesn't get hit by spam filters is interesting. Um, what, um, how do you deal with um, uh, negative comments or uh, people who are frustrated? How, how do you respond to that type of stuff um, on e each of your networks? So um, let's start with Brian and then go back to Elizabeth on that. And then Claudia, if you have anything you would like to add to that, please do. Well, we've been lucky to have our, um, our platforms up for a while, so we don't necessarily always react uh, when we get negative comments because our community mm -hmm. uh, tends to start a conversation around negative comments mm -hmm. and sort of handles it for us. And, that, and we really want to provide a platform particularly where people can feel free to say things that they agree with us on or disagree with us on. Mm -hmm. um, and we're lucky to have a community that um, engages in those conversations. If there is a misrepresentation of fact, um, then we will engage to correct the fact. But we try to do that um, in a way that isn't directly um, directly addressing the specific person. Mm -hmm. Even though you want to get into conversations, lots of conversations on social media, we like to pick the conversations that we get into. Mm -hmm. um, and so oftentimes we will look for ways to engage with folks who um, either are confused by the dialogue that is going back and forth and, and uh, provide facts for them or uh, support those who are trying to support us. But we generally don't um, ban people, and uh, we don't delete comments. Uh, we do have a policy, which we post in our notes. I believe it should still be there on, um, on our Facebook page, uh, where we um, only delete comments when they are direct uh, attacks on another user. That makes sense, given your uh, history of free speech. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Elizabeth, have you run into um, Negative comments or? Yeah, yeah. so um, we are starting to, now that we have a little bit more of a presence even just locally, um, it's really nice when <laughs> someone else steps up and addresses uh, a negative comment. So like Brian, if, it, if they address it, then we're, you know, we're just good. Um, if it's just like, you know, we do we do a lot of uh, work and advocacy around um, services for people who are living unhoused, and so sometimes we get some like more like political area of of comments, and you know we might just like someone's <laughs> comment back if if somebody in our community took care of it, or we'll just leave it. Um, if we get it's when we get something that's more like a Yelp reviewy. They're like, these people don't, blah, 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 kind of uh, um, that may hurt our image um, as what we want it to be. Um, that's when we give a very, like, we, don't, we will not address the issue on social media. That's for a private channel. And so we say that. We say, hey, we 100% want to make sure that everybody is well informed about what we do and why we make the choices that we make, and that if you're dissatisfied with anything, we'd love to have a personal conversation with you, contact us at this number, um, or stop in, or whatever, right? Um, when I have said that, I've never had anyone follow up in the comments stop, <laughs> but uh, that it's, I think it's, it's more important that our community know we are listening, and that we are willing to engage, um, but also that we're not gonna get into a like Twitter war. That is not something that we do. So. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I Go think that the, those comments make a make 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 a lot of sense. I think that when you're dealing with a presentation where you're talking to non to people that are not in our world and don't know our world, the best the best thing is to listen, and hopefully you have had had a chance to ex to explain or share some information about how there's not enough legal aid 
you know, for everybody that needs an attorney because generally the comment is that is that, you know, I called legal aid, I called, I looked for help and I didn't get any help or that's one type of comment, right? So laying a foundation of why if you get 200 calls a day and you can play six cases, um, you know, in that week for a particular subject matter, explaining how how the legal aid is also making really hard choices and that they're very aware of that. So that's one way of handling that. Um, but the other thing is when people come at you from a, you know, oh, legal aid is a waste of time, it doesn't do anything for anyone. And on that, if you have specific stories, I think that you need to humanize the work that we do. And, you you know, you may have one or two anecdotes not very long on the, a person, a case, where it impacted a family, a community, and, the, and, the, and the, the legal work that was done was just really unbelievable healing uh, for the whole community. That, that goes a long way. And I think that my third, my third tip, what I've learned as I've gone a little bit older, is that sometimes you don't have to react either. Sometimes you just have to listen and acknowledge. And particularly if you're in a group, uh, you, you can take the conversation one-on-one -on -one at a later time so sometimes you just have to stay calm and and acknowledge and offer to talk later on or give a card after the event. And the other thing is sometimes people who are asking you really hard questions or that are making really uh, prodding comments, and I think this is also online, they're doing so because maybe they're trying to help you. You never know the intentions behind, um, you know, because nobody reads mine. So, I think that when you're talking with non-legal folks, it's important to kind of have these things in mind because you need to be prepared for anything that gets thrown at you. But I think oftentimes just stay back and, and then think, of, do I use an anecdote? Do I provide some facts? Or do I make an approach later on and offer to have a one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, Claudia has, has two wonderful uh, or many wonderful points there, but two that I would like to reinforce is if you can take and use client stories, client images, those things along, make sure you've got their permission, your post will do so much better. If we put down this case we recently won as a short intro, that has a very small impact compared to picture of the litigant, why it's important, talk about how it helps someone, um, regain access to their kids that were trying to be deported out of the country unlawfully. And that picture of the family there, that personal message goes so much further. Also, unlearn all of the terrible language we were taught in law school for how to talk about things precisely and focus on using plain language. There's a wonderful resource out there called Write Clearly um, that will help you look at legalese and give you suggested plain language, but your audience is going to be turned off by the legalese. They're going to go away. You need to focus group some of the messages. Daniel Ediger worked with us at Northwest Justice Project putting together a guide for taking our legal help videos, and he actually went out to community centers, uh, put them in front of individuals, and then got feedback. And again and again, it was legalese uh, and things that everybody in our office would know, but that actual clients had no idea what we were talking about. And we ended up redoing the script on almost every video that was focus group. So get out there and let uh, real people take a look and give you feedback and make sure they know that if they don't understand something, it's not their fault. It, it's your fault for how you're conveying it. They're evaluating the material. We're, this is not a quiz to see if they got it. It's to see if we're conveying something. Um, we've got another minute or two here. I'd like to let each of the panelists uh, go through one last tip or one last thing that they think is important. If there's, if there's anything else they would like to add, um, there was a question in here, which is, will we be posting um, all of the materials? Yes, the, they'll all be available on the website. Nathan Resnick, who works with me at LSNTAP, he is attending the webinar. He will put up a summary blog post in about a week that will include the links and the slides also. Uh, the video will be made available. Um, is, is there any closing comments, Elizabeth, that, that you would like to add as we're in our last minute or an, and a half here? Um, 
No, uh, that is good. Um, I know that my email is in the materials. I encourage anybody who has any questions about what we do or um, wants some insight on what you're trying to do, please just reach out to me. Um, and I, I love to chat and have an open door, uh, and that includes an open email. So thanks. That is a great piece of advice in and of itself. Get advice from somebody else who does this. Take them out to coffee. Talk to them in person or online. That's one of the best ways to learn. Uh, Brian. I'll throw in one more tip. Uh, it has to do with uh, the use of TweetDeck. Um, even if you use a tool like Buffer, I still recommend like opening up a tab in your browser with TweetDeck. Um, TweetDeck allows you to put in search terms uh, that monitor not just your own feed, but Twitter more generally on subjects. So that's how you can find out some allies that you might not know that you actually had and retweet them and start to build relationships with them. And you can find active individuals who really care about your topics and uh, amplify their message and get engaged with them. I think TweetDeck's pretty amazing for as a listening tool too. Yeah, finding somebody who is very active in, in that area of social media can do so much to boost your platform and be a wonderful ally. Great tip there. Um, Claudia, any, any closing tips? Yeah, I think that we all need to approach this with a spirit of humility and also a spirit of self-confidence, which seems contradictory. But I think that going out there the work that we do is extremely valuable and important, and it's meaningful, um, not just to us, but to the families and the communities we represent. So you need to always keep that, you know, as your standing base. And as you go in and experiment, be it with social media or talking to the real world or talking to people who are not at all interested or know anything, um, keep Keep, keep it simple, be humble, and be willing to learn because it's not going to work the first time. It may not work the second time, but keep trying and challenge yourself because the only way we're going to have allies, we're going to grow, we're going to become better is by experimenting and putting ourselves out there. And so let's just get out of the comfort zone. Let's use the technology that's out there. And then let's go out and use our own relationships and talk outside of our world to start really breaking the, the, the legal binary and really bringing lawyers' work to be meaningful in the context of the societies that we're living in. So just stay humble and know that what you're doing is good work and put yourself out there. And if it doesn't work, pivot and try again. And that's how your organization is going to grow. That's how your work is going to grow. That's how your relationships are going to grow. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for coming out today. Um, we will have a follow-up email that has uh, materials. There will be resources put up on both the WSBA's website and on lsntap.org um, that will have all of these materials archived. Um, if you've got any questions, please reach out to uh, the panelists. We are happy to help you um, learn how to do this, and we look forward to having more partners that we can actively engage with.